On this episode of the ISO with myself, your host, Dan Dickow for the Gonzaga Nation Media Network with the NBA Finals kicking off this week, um, and it's the Golden State Warriors against the Boston Celtics, thought I would release three previously recorded episodes of the ISO. The first will be with Golden State Warriors head coach, Steve Kerr, who joined me in spring of 2020 to talk a lot of different basketball uh, experiences, thoughts, as well as I come clean with a story about a college friend taking my phone and prank phone calling Steve Kerr while he was still a player with the Portland Trailblazers. The second one will be with current Boston Celtic assistant coach Damon Stoudemire, who as most recently was the head coach at the University of Pacific. I interviewed him uh, about a year ago last summer um, when he was still in that role. About a week or two later, he took the job with the Boston Celtics as an assistant coach to join fellow Portland native Ime Udoka on the staff of the Celtics. We talk about uh, a lot of his playing career, how he got into coaching, his philosophy, um, and then just kind of talk about the history of some of Portland basketball. The third of the re-releases for the ISO podcast tied into the NBA finals is Boston Celtics assistant coach, Ben Sullivan. Ben's from the Portland area as well, played at Lake Oswego High School just outside Portland, played at the University of Portland where he was a tremendous player for a number of years. Didn't think he was going to get into coaching, was actually doing a number of different things, uh, trying to build a business career of his own. And then he got started coaching a youth team that got the coaching bug going for him. He details and shares his experience of growing his coaching career. Uh, he won an NBA title a season ago with the Milwaukee Bucks. He talks a little bit about working alongside Giannis Antetokounmpo uh, before making the switch and uh, agreeing to be a part of the Celtics staff. So hope you enjoy these three re-releases of the ISO. Click that like, subscribe, review button. If you've got an idea of a guest that you would like me to reach out to, send it my way. I'll see what I can do. But thanks again for being a listener of the ISO on the Gonzaga Nation Media Network. Welcome to another episode of the ISO with myself, your host, Dan Dickow for SB Live Sports. Today's guest, someone who I looked up to and admired as a young player growing up in the Portland area because he's also from there, has become a tremendous coach at the college level, but he's just made the transition uh, back to the NBA, the 96 NBA Rookie of the Year, Damon Stoudemire. Damon, appreciate you joining. Um, a little bit of difficulty finding time because you had a new opportunity placed in front of you to go join another fellow Portland guy, Ime Udoka, on the staff of the Celtics. Uh, what was that decision process like? Uh, you know, it was it was hard from the standpoint of, you know, most of the time when I make decisions, I don't think about myself because I know that I'll be all right, you know, whether it works out or it doesn't work out, you know, but what, what people don't understand is, is you know, you, you, you got a coaching staff, um, you have, you know, players. And so for me, you know, one, I was wanting to make sure, you know, behind the scenes that the staff was going to be fine you know, and, and then two, uh, once I finally made my decision, you know, talking to the team and, you know, trying to, trying to, uh, you know, get guys to, you know, understand and take the emotions out of everything and, you know, not be prisoners of the moment and, you know, try to, you know, let's kind of look at it, you know, uh, in another perspective, because, you know, it's, it's definitely different. It's different for me. It's going to be different for me going to the pros. It'll be different for the staff now that there's a new coach and obviously the players playing for somebody, but no, it's never easy, you know, and this was such a unique situation because, you know, of how I got the job and where we started taking this, taking it over, being on probation for three years and things of that nature. So, um, but I, but, you know, um, I made my decision and, you know, I, I think it's a great decision. Um, you know, the Boston Celtics are a 
prestigious franchise and their top, what we call it, we would say three or four franchise in professional sports, not only basketball itself. So I just felt it was an opportunity along with, like you said, uh, you know, knowing E may really well, you know, that made it really easy to have comfort in knowing the guy that I was working for. This wasn't something that was plucked out of left field. And, you know, um, you know, I've been, you know, we've all been through that before, you know, where, you know, I've had opportunities, you know, not as a head coach, but as an assistant before to, to go places. And you're like, ah, I just don't know because I don't, I don't know about this situation, but I'm, I'm comfortable because I know the guy who I'll be working, working for, working with. Yeah, we both know Ime well from the Portland area, and I was a little surprised Ime went into the coaching profession, I guess. I, I remember we we were at Summer League, and he was still trying to figure out if he was going to play one more year in Spain, and we were talking in the concourse at UNLV. He's like, Popovich just reached out to me. He wants to talk about a coaching job. And I looked at him, I said, you probably need to take that meeting because most coaches under pop end up moving forward and having a great uh, right. run with it. Did you always feel you were going to get into coaching when you were done playing? No, I didn't. I, I never even thought about it, to be honest, which I think, you know, people would ask me that I want to get into coaching, but just like with anything, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a, a Monday evening quarterback, man. You know, you, you, <laughs> you critique with your boys, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, but never did I think about wrapping my mind around the whole dynamic. Someone from the Portland area who I got to know a little bit as he was a young high school player from Lake Oswego, became a great college player, had some stints as a professional overseas before trying to figure out what his passion is, and his passion is coaching. He's got a tremendous future in the NBA. He's already won an NBA title a season ago as an assistant coach with the Milwaukee Bucks, currently about to join the staff of Ime Udoka and the Boston Celtics, Ben Sullivan. Ben, thanks for joining. How is life? Because I understand you're just about to move to Boston. Yeah, life is a little bit crazy right now. You know, we had the extended season. Um, we were fortunate to go on that deep playoff run, and you know, uh, afterwards, uh, email called me and then, you know, you change jobs and then you got to move and all of a sudden it's just, it's been a whirlwind. So been very busy <laughs> this past few weeks. Well, when you look at your, your coaching career and your path in the NBA, you've, you've kind of moved around a little bit, but you've always been around tremendous coaches and I would imagine tremendous people. I don't know Popovich more than just a, a passing hello or, or coach bud, the same way, but I know he may very well. He's a great coach. He's a great person. Um, what have those guys kind of taught you along the way to help kind of advance your career as you keep going in the NBA coaching ranks? Man, I mean, when I, when I first got to San Antonio and like being in the video room, um, this is what I always tell everybody. It was kind of like getting your master's degree in coaching like it's not just pop but there's tremendous coaches there there was Mike Budnels or Brett Brown and Chip England Chad Forcier Ime Udoka was there and you know Jim Boylan and Sean Marks and like you you don't just learn from the head coach you learn from everybody and they're all like teaching you and investing in you and helping you grow and pushing you and holding you accountable and it was just like I, I look back at those two years as like kind of the foundation for like my understanding of the NBA on the coaching side. Everybody gets into coaching a little bit differently. My, for example, I had one year with the Portland trailblazers uh, in player development while I was doing some front office scouting um, before I got out of that and went the business and broadcasting route. But um, you got in, as you mentioned, as a video intern with the San Antonio Spurs, but you and I had talked off camera, and I remember this from conversations we had years ago at the uh, Kingsway Open Gyms that I used to run in Vancouver. What At what point did you realize when your playing career was done and you were in everyday life mode that coaching was really something that you wanted to pursue? You know, it's funny because, like, growing up, I – I didn't get along with every coach that I had, <laughs> not unlike some players. And I, I told myself, I was like, man, like, I don't want to be a coach. Like coaches are like, they're always trying to hold you back or whatever. And, you know, like I, I never saw myself as a coach growing up. 
I did have other coaches tell me they thought I would be a coach, but I was like, no, I'm never going to do it. And um, so I was working for a construction company um, and I was a, like an office manager and I was, you know, the day to day and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people I worked with and I was like, I was content, I guess. And, um, but my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, uh, Bailey, she was like, Hey, why don't you try coaching? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, just coach like a, a kid's team, you know, coach, whatever. And I was like, it's like, what? And so I thought about it and I went back and I coached Lake Oswego sixth grade boys team. You know, I called my old high school coach and was like, Hey, I'm thinking about coaching. And blah. he's like, yeah, just, you know, we need, we need a sixth grade boys coach. And I was like, all right. You know, it's like one or two practices a week, some games on the weekend. And, uh, I think at that time you get paid like a thousand bucks or something like that for like six months or whatever, however long it is. You don't do it for the money. You just do it for fun. And uh, so I get the basketballs and I do, do the little meeting with all the coaches. Like we all meet and that's like the seventh grade boys, eighth grade, girl side, everything like the high school program runs from like the top down. Right. And they kind of tell you what they want to do. No zone, man to man, how they want to develop all this stuff. And I'm like, OK, it sounds great and all that. So I show up for practice. Um, I have not planned anything out. Like I haven't like done a plan of like all the stuff I'm going to do. I just kind of like want to meet the kids and like have a little fun and just kind of meet and greet style. Hello. And we get there and I, I remember this, like it was yesterday after five minutes of practice, I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Like just teaching sixth grade kids how to do a left-handed layup. And like watching them like try and try again and like get better and do full court. And like literally after five minutes of practice, I, I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be a coach. I don't know what that meant at the time. So I called my, my girlfriend Bailey and I was like, I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Like, I want to, I want to be a coach. Like I want to. And, and at that time, my only goal was like, I want to be a coach. And, and that to me meant like, just pay the bills. Like what if I could coach and pay my bills, like that was all, that was my main goal. That's all I had. That's amazing. Five minutes in uh, of actually coaching your own team and you were sold. That's what you wanted to do. So you go from coaching that sixth grade Lake Oswego youth team. And, and by the way, Lake Oswego has got one of the best high school coaches in the country now, Marshall Cho, who was at University of Portland for a while. Um, so I had to give a shout out to, to Marshall because he's such a oh, good guy. Marshall's the best. He is. So five minutes in, you know, this is what you want to do. Where did now your opportunity with the San Antonio Spurs in, in becoming a video intern come into play? Because that's a big jump, sixth grade basketball to San Antonio Spurs. I know, that's where I started. Like, it sometimes blows my mind to think about it. Um, so I was coaching the sixth grade boys team. So that's just nights and weekends, right? I'm still working the, the other job as an office manager. So that's one year of that office manager and doing sixth grade boys. Then the summer I coached AAU and still kept my job. Then coming back that fall, I was like, oh, I want to be a coach. And I talked to Eric Reveno and, and his staff, you know, Michael Wolf, Joel Sabaka, they who coached me. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a coach. And I'm talking to them this whole time. And they offered me to be their video coordinator but that was an unpaid position. They're like, look, we don't have it in the budget. You know, we're a small school, whatever. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. So for that year, I worked an office job in Vancouver, Washington. Like I would get up, drive up, be there by 7.30 or 8, you know, work until 2. And then I would, because I, I think the, the pilots practice at 3 or 4, I can't remember. I, I work until 2 get some lunch, drive down to Portland and I would work until nine or 10 and come home. And like, literally it's like a blackout period. Like I just remember like, just working for so much. Like I barely saw anybody and like, you know, I'm up there recording practice and I'm doing all kinds of stuff. But what I didn't know at the time was a, the video platform that they used was sports code, which is now like all over sports everywhere. It's what we use now in the NBA. It's, uh, you know, all over professional sports and stuff like that. So it taught me, about the video side of sports, which I didn't know. But essentially I had to work one job as an office manager to pay for my ability to go invest in myself as a coach. And um, 
that was a really, really rewarding time. It was a lot of hours, but like, you just don't really think of it like that. And then the summer came and since I was unpaid, I wasn't restricted by anything. So I coached the AAU team again and while still keeping my other job, then I got offered to be an assistant coach at Lewis and Clark college for Denari Foreman. And David Jackson was also an assistant. So it was us two with uh, Denari there. And uh, that was a really cool experience coaching D3. Cause those kids, like they love the game so much and they, they just, they compete and try real hard. And, you know, they have some talent. There's some good players like in Whitman, Whittier, Lewis and Clark, like all over Like that league has some good talented players. Um, and, uh, yeah, then after that, I got offered to be, after that season, I got offered to go coach at Clark College, a JUCO. And so at this whole time, I'm coaching an AAU team during the summer. And so I'm like, okay, AAU programs, like it's blossoming. Um, it was Elite 24 with a guy named Greg Dundon. We were growing that from the ground up at that point. Uh, he's still coaching that team, actually, and doing real well, by the way. And uh, then uh, at Clark College, this is during the summer. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be working at AAU, coaching at Clark. Clark's in Vancouver. My other job's in Vancouver. It cuts out the commute. I'm like, okay, I got my little, like, I just bought a house. Like, I'm just like, all right, I got everything set up. Like, I didn't anticipate going anywhere. I'm like, I'm good. Um, and then Eme called me. <laughs> <laughs> so Eme calls and uh, he says, you know, he's like, hey, you're coaching uh, up in Portland, right? And I was like, yeah, why? And he's like, well, do you want to come, you know, try and get in the Spurs video room? And I was like, I was like, what is that? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'd never heard of a, like a video room or like a, you know, a program or like at that point, anything. I'm just like local, you know, Portland, Vancouver guy, like in my little, just trying to make it or whatever. And uh, he's like, yeah, you know, the Spurs video room, we have interns and this and that. And he's like, I think you should check it out. I think you'd be good at it. And I was like, okay, I'll try. And uh, I sent my resume down and then I got a call from Mike Budenholzer and did a, a phone interview and he checked my, my references and all this. And I fly down to an interview and, um, you know, I come back, I get offered the job and I'm talking to people like, you know, you do in coaching or playing or whatever, you get an offer, you talk to the people who are close to you like, hey, what do you think? And, and all that stuff. And I, I remember this story vividly, like it was yesterday. It was Michael Wolf, an assistant coach then at University of Portland who had like, he was crazy smart, video tech, all this stuff. And he's just like, he put it to me like this. He's like, hey, if the San Antonio Spurs want you in your video room, you go to the San Antonio Spurs video room. He's like, I don't care if you have to take out a loan to pay all your bills and figure it out, like scrape and claw. Like if, if the bottom line is the people that go to the Spurs video room come out the other side, like smart coaches, successful, all that stuff. He's like, that's where you have to go. He said, figure it out, make it work, go there. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so I uh, so I took the job and that's kind of what, what got me into the NBA. Eme was the person that got me into the NBA. And now here he is, a head coach, and he called me again. That's uh, that's tremendous. I knew a couple of those stops, you know, the Lewis and Clark, Denari Foreman, and, and David Jackson. Uh, I didn't know the Clark College stop. And the fact that Eme another Portland area guy uh, gave you a heads up in the opportunity to interview for those positions shows a lot about how tight knit that Portland basketball community is something that you and I have been around for quite some time playing at open gyms in different places, playing in the Portland pro-am. What are some of your fondest memories of, of growing up playing pickup in the Portland area? I don't know. I think like you said, the Portland program was cool. It was just, it was kind of cool how it like migrated everywhere. Like you remember one summer it's at Jefferson and one summer it's at Grant and one summer it's at SEI and then it's at PCC and like, it's, it was all over. So you got a feel for like playing in the heart of the city. Um, you know, I think growing up playing on my AAU team with for Canyon Chapman, uh, ICP, I think we were the first ICP team, if I'm not wrong. And like, you know, we had some really good players on our team. Chris Rogers went to Arizona, Brandon Lincoln went to Oregon, Curtis Lincoln been like a super phenom since he was in like sixth grade. He could dunk with like in sixth grade. Everyone's like, Curtis is the best player ever. <laughs> and uh, 
we had Chris Stevens who ended up playing at Oregon State. J.R. Moore played at Portland State. Um, who else we have? Oh, Thomas Gardner played at Missouri, ended up in the NBA for a little bit. Uh, so that was a lot of fun being on those teams. And, you know, I'm sure as you can attest to playing as long as you did, a lot longer, you're a lot better than me. But like some of the stuff, like as the years go by, you don't really remember the games as much as you thought you would. You more remember the guys and like busting on each other and like the time, the camaraderie, like just, I don't know how fun it was like watching other games and laughing and I don't know. It was great. So yeah. I definitely miss yeah. it. Well, you look at the the staff that he put together. Uh, he hired Damon Stoudemire, yourself, Aaron Miles, who was another Portland area guy who played at Kansas kind of was on the fringe of the NBA for a number of years. He's been, with the Golden State Warriors organization for, for some time. There's a definite Portland flavor. I will say this, though. Ime and I texted when when he got the job of congratulating and everything. I'm going to have to give him a hard time for not at least, like, offering me uh, some type of position <laughs> within the staff. Oh, yeah. He at least should have called you to just kind of vet you out a little bit and see what your interest level was. 100%. Yeah, I've, uh, I've known Ime since high school, playing against him yeah. in open gyms. Uh, played against him, uh, pro-ams, and then obviously we were teammates with the Blazers. I think he's going to do tremendous uh, as a first-time head coach. But when you go into the Celtics organization, and I played there for, for a half a year before I got injured, there's something different when you walk in that practice facility and you look up and you see all the banners up there, and then you look on the floor and it's the parquet. Have you had that walk into the facility moment yet as an assistant coach? where you're just like, this is real. This is one of the greatest sports organizations ever. Actually, I did. So I got a quick tour. We had a coaches retreat uh, out in Massachusetts. And uh, so I went out there, went to the facility, and it was a quick tour, kind of looked around everything, like said hello to people, got in the car, we left. Um, and then uh, when I got back, I had a little bit more time. So um, the coach retreat is over. We come back. Uh, I walk into the facility and there's not very many people there at all, like maybe three, four people in the whole building. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get a workout in. So I go up there, I go, I go in and I'm walking across the practice facility. I'm looking down and I see the floor and then I look up and I see like, I see all the banners and I'm just kind of like, like th at that moment that you're talking about where you're like, wow, look at all of those championship banners. Like that is an alarming number of banners and you realize like there is something special about this place the history the just the you know the iconic moments in the in the history of the league is just it is something different something special well you also just are coming off of a, an nba title as an assistant coach with the milwaukee bucks walk us through just how difficult it is to win a championship you, a lot of times people on the outside don't realize just how hard it is give us a little bit of snapshot of what that run through the playoffs was like yeah um well first of all I just want to say thanks to the Milwaukee Buck organization like from John Horst to Mike Budenholzer and everybody there like it's a first class championship organization where everybody there is tremendous and the one thing I, I want to say about them um as I'm making this transition is like the way they treat people there is truly special like they it's it's a great organization. I was very, very thankful to be a part of it for the three years that I was. And uh, but to answer your question, um, <laughs> the thing that I I, I kind of knew, but I didn't really know because I was a part of actually two championship runs with San Antonio. So my first year in the league, we went to the finals with San Antonio and lost to the Miami Heat. Um, that was that year that Ray Allen hit that corner three over yeah. Tony Parker. That was my first year in the league. I was in the back in the video room, like putting up the plastic for the champagne bath. And then like Ray Allen hits that shot. They're like, take everything down, like pulling all the stuff down and everything. <laughs> like it was, it's a wild moment. So I wasn't like, I didn't see the shot actually when it happened. Cause I'm in like back doing stuff. And then anyway, so it's a different story. And uh, then the following year, I was a video, so I was just a video intern or player development intern in San Antonio. The following year, I get a bump on the assistant video coordinator, and we go on a championship run and actually win the title. And, like, you think you know when you're a video guy, you're doing this stuff, you're helping all these things, like how hard it is. And then, you know, 
Coach Bud calls and I go to Atlanta, and I haven't been on a championship run since. So that was 2014. Now this is 2021. And the, the perspective I have now after being in the league for a long time is just the respect about how hard it is to actually get it done. Like when you're first year in, second year, you don't know anything. Like I'm just learning, trying to figure anything out. Like I'm just an, just an idiot. Just like, oh yeah, here's your video. You know, I'm just <laughs> like trying to help as much as I can, learn as much as I can. But as you go, you realize like each and every chance is special and there's no guarantee that you're going to be back again. And, you know, you you need a few different things. Like, first of all, you got to be good. Um, second, you got to perform. I think third, you got to have luck. Like, you just got to get lucky, like have a shot bounce in, have one of their shot bounces out, have a rebound, like, like clang off the rim more towards your guy than one of their guys. And uh, you got to be healthy. Like, health is a factor for all teams. I think one of the things that got swept under the rug about the Bucks is, you know, lost our starting shooting guard after the second game or third game in the playoffs. And then we had to figure it out from there. Uh, but every team had their own health issues all the way down. And like, that's just part of, it's almost like a war of attrition because it's two months more after the season. Right. So like, it's just more basketball and more basketball and more basketball and like, you know, and staying healthy and luck are kind of connected in that way. Like, you know, unfortunately sometimes just, you know, you play it enough. Sometimes you go get a rebound and fall on someone's ankle and you're done. And it's unfortunate, but as part of the sport, that's why you got to get lucky and hopefully you get some of the luck on your side. I like the description of those three points that that make up many championship runs, but you also had a cornerstone in your France franchise in Giannis. That's pretty darn special. Uh, I've read an article or two over the past couple of years, kind of highlighting and talking about some of the work um, that you have done with him to help him along his way. When I look at Giannis, I look at somebody who has continued to improve every single year. He plays with a passion. He plays to win as opposed to generate stats, which unfortunately a lot of guys in the NBA do. Um, but I also see a humble superstar. When you see Giannis, what do you see? When I see Giannis, um, determination. Just, just determined to improve, to win, to compete day after day year after year, um, I feel like there isn't anything that can shake him off that line of like, just a, like, he's just trying to get better. Like, it's just a, uh, it's just a march to improvement. Like at your, like you said, he's one of those, he's one of those guys, like you can almost see it in his stats, like year after year after year of improvement. And you don't get that way without being determined to, you know, that that's your goal. That's your mantra. That's what you want to do. And, you know, I have the utmost respect for, how dedicated he is to that. Lots of assistant coaches as they're kind of growing their career and building their network have uh, aspirations to be a head coach. Now everything comes in due time. You got to be, you know, aligned with the right head coach. You've got to uh, have success at the previous stops that you've been at. Do you have aspirations as a head coach and what will it take for you to finally get that opportunity if it's something that you want? Yeah, well, I, I no, I definitely want to be a head coach. Um, but I'm starting to understand, you know, there's only 30 jobs in this league. And so once again, the, the, the luck factor comes back into play. So I'll say my, one of my, uh, my main goal this year is to help the Boston Celtics as much as possible. My main, my own goal for myself is to just try and become one of those potential future head coaching candidates. You know, there's tons of smart, respected, talented coaches out there who are all deserving, but there's only 30 jobs. And so like, it's unfortunate, but not every one of us is ever going to get a head coaching job. And um, I would just like to be able to put myself in the category as a potential candidate. And if it, if it works out, you know, the timing, the luck, ownership group, the team, the GM, all those factors have to fall into place. Uh, if I'm fortunate enough, it'll happen. If it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, but I'll try. With, in regards to your kind of interesting entry into coaching in the NBA world, what type of advice would you give uh, young, maybe high school or college age players or young coaches uh, 
as far as what they need to do and how to prepare for their own coaching career? Um, the first thing I, I usually tell young coaches uh, and young aspiring coaches is the same thing, which is <laughs> uh, stolen from Bill Belichick. So it's do your job. And somebody told me this one. It, it, it was told to me as well. And it, it rings true. Do your job. Do the job that you have. Like a lot of people are consistently worried about what's next and what's next. And like you asked me about being a head coach, like a future head coach, like would I like to be one? Yeah, who wouldn't want to be a, a head coach? But like my main focus is to help the Boston Celtics now. How Whatever that means and whatever that entails, like my main job right now is to help Ime, help Boston, help the players in any way that I can. And that's my main stuff. If anything else happens after that, then that's just whatever. I have no control over that. But my main job right now is to help them as much as possible. And so I tell young people a lot, they're like, oh, I want to be an assistant. I want to be that. I want to get to MBA. I want to be you know, a college assistant. I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm like, that's great. It's great to have goals. You should have goals and aspirations and places that you want to go. But are you focused on the job that you're, you have right now? Are you being the best assistant, assistant coach to the head coach where you're at right now? Are you being the best video guy you can be right now? The best GA you can be right now? Like if you focus there, I think that the rest of the stuff takes care of itself. I think where you get tripped up a lot of times when you're worried about, oh, well, this other person is doing that and this other guy has that and this other whatever. Like if you're constantly worried about all, all the stuff that everybody else is doing, if you're looking to your left and looking to your right and wondering why you don't have what this person has or that person has, that's the wrong mindset. Like you should be focused on what you need to do to be the best you that you can be. Tremendous. I love that insight and advice to possible up and coming coaches. Do your job. Well, Ben, I appreciate the time. Uh, it was nice to reconnect. I know we've, we've text messaged occasionally over the years, but I, I haven't seen you in person other than now this zoom. So hopefully at some point I can get to a Celtics game and uh, maybe heckle you and Eme from the stands. If I can get a good <laughs> seat. So thanks again for joining. And I appreciate the time. All right, man. Thanks for having me. It was great.